Good morning, church. So good to be here again, being used by God. I just love it. Let us bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for your blessings here today. We thank you for your spirit with us, Father, opening up our hearts to receive your word here today. And Father, we thank you again for, for bringing us here safely again to hear your word and opening up our minds and our hearts and our souls. We just love hearing your word, Father. And Father, we ask that if there's a spirit of sleepiness or any hindrance spirit that is going to stop us from hearing the word, we remove it right now in your name, Jesus, Father. And Father, we thank you for traveling mercies for those who are on their way. Bring them safely and take us all home safely today. This we ask of you in Jesus' name. Amen. When the Holy Spirit placed this message on my heart, to minister to you this morning, I couldn't have thinking about our cleaning ministry. Our cleaning crew, you know, at the end of the service when we identify our cleaning crew on a Friday. If we have our, anyone from our cleaning crew, if you could just raise your hands, I know you probably, and if you could just stand up, we'd like to appreciate you. Come on, stand up. They're really important to us. I, I think it takes a very special person to do this. You know, they, they, break, they bring the word of God alive. You know, they're, they're doing their work for the Lord and not for man. Amen? Amen? It takes a special, humble person. So God bless you. And with that in mind, many of us don't like cleaning, do we? <laughs> and I'm certain that quite a few of them who volunteer don't like cleaning. I certainly don't like it. But the Lord is asking us this morning, brothers and sisters, to, to think about, well, not to think about, but we need to start cleaning our house. Amen. Not the one home. No. <laughs> the one here. The one that he lives in. The one that you invited him in to take over. The temple of Jesus Christ. He would like us this morning to take whatever it is that is heavy on us and remove it. So the title of the message this morning is House Cleaning with Jesus. Amen? Amen? So let's examine the evidence. Some of us worship. Now, fortunately for us this morning, Pastor didn't have to beg for us to, to worship with more enthusiasm. But there are some weeks we, we have to to. to, to Gear you up again and again and again, you know? Some of us have this depressed look on us, and, 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 and we have to beg in order for us to really worship our sovereign God. We have those who are walking around with their heads down all the time, and, and you know, and after a while we start to look to see, well, what are they looking at? <laughs> you know? And then we have some that move with no energy. And if we are not careful, we will probably trip over what is holding them back. So we want to take that away from this morning because we're supposed to be rejoicing always. Amen? Amen. So the ball and chain and the felt, whatever it is that is holding us back, we can leave it in the car park or leave it at the door because when we come in here today, we are in the house of the Lord. Amen. This is our safe place. Yes? Thessalonians, rejoice always, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. It is his will for you, for us to rejoice. And if it is that we are not, and we are hanging around, and, and we are depressed, God is not going to be too happy for us being like this. He doesn't want that for us, especially when we are here. So, how are we going to get rid of what's holding us back? How are we going to do some house cleaning? Let's look at Hebrews 12. Sorry I didn't give it to you up, up front, but Hebrews 12.
And another main text that we want to keep is Colossians 3. And Psalm 51. The others will come up on the board. So we should be at Hebrews 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which is so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So every runner must train in order to win their race. Yeah? They must be fit to endure the race. Their bodies, bodies must be lean, and their clothing must be light in weight to make them faster. We two Christians must shed some weight that is slowing us down. And this is not the bodily weight we are talking about. This, this weight that is taking away the joy in the Lord. We need to clean this house of ours, this holy temple. Amen? So our scriptures say, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Notice it says, every weight and the sin. So it's not just sin that is keeping us down. So, which en easily ensnares us, meaning capture or catch us or entangle us. So if it's not the sin that is only the sin that is weighing us down, then what do we need to get rid of that is, that is slowing us down? But it's interesting. In making yourself lighter, and we're we referring to the, the soul and not your actual body weight, you know, before we look at how do we get rid of or make ourselves lighter, there are three areas I need you to keep in mind. One, commitment. Two, discipline. And three, habits. That's commitment, discipline, and habits. In order for us to make ourselves lighter and feel this joy, we must take into consideration these three areas. So commitment. Merriam-Webster give us this definition of commitment. There are three um, definitions she gave. A promise to do or give something. Two, a promise to be loyal to someone or something. And the attitude of someone who works very hard to do or support something. So all three refers to a promise or an attitude. But these can all change, yes? We can break our promises. An attitude can change. But if we have the right foundation, it will be difficult for us to break our promises and for us to have that attitude change, amen? So what is this foundation? Well, simply, in Matthew 22, 37, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And he went on further in John 14, 15, said, If you love me, keep my commandments. So if our foundation is Jesus Christ, it will make us very difficult for us to break this commitment. Now, some of you may say, yes, of course, we all believe in Jesus Christ. We, we come to church. and Yes, but we are talking about our true foundation in Christ. A solid ground built not on man, not on your husband, not on your wife, not on your children, not on your brother or your sister, and not on your job. We are talking about a foundation in Christ. And why is that important? Well, all these things disappoint us at some point in time. God is not a God of disappointment. He will never leave us nor forsake us. So if we have a solid foundation in Christ, and that is what he wants, he wants to be your all in all, when disappointment comes, and they will come, it will be easier for us to handle it if we are strong in Christ. We can, gain from, we can pull from his strength. He will take us 
um, from place to place. We'll be able to endure through those storms. But some of us, what we do is we have Jesus Christ there, yes, but he is not our all in all. It's part time. The second area that we have to look at is discipline. Now, what is discipline? One, control that is gained by requiring that the rules or orders be obeyed and punishing bad behavior. Two, a way of behaving that shows a willingness to obey rules or orders. And three, behavior that is judged by how well it follows a set of rules or orders. So let's change it up a bit and how it applies to our foundation with Christ. Control that is gained by requiring that God's word be obeyed and punishment, punishment for bad behavior goes with not obeying God's word. Amen? How many people know that there are consequences to our sin? Yes? Yeah. Second, a way of behaving that shows a willingness to obey God's word. And third, a behavior that is judged by how well we follow God's word. See how easy we could just take a definition and apply it to our lives? Same thing with scripture. We will be judged at the end of the day. Now, if we look at the athlete, they're willing to do what it takes to become lean to win that race. Why? Well, simply because they love doing it. They love what it's all about. They enjoy what they're doing. They know where they're heading. So they're willing to do what it takes to get there. And they, the ability to have control for their actions, for example, having a special diet, or their training special, within special times, their discipline, they know that they have to get up in the morning to, 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 to um, train, they're not going to lie in the night, they, they're very disciplined in what they're doing, simply because they enjoy what they're doing, they love it, they know what they're about. Does that describe us with Jesus Christ? Discipline brings habit, which is the third area. The athlete in his discipline creates the right habits, and he's able to get rid of the bad ones. As a Christian, my brothers and sisters, we must be committed to cleaning God's house, our heart, our soul, and our minds. We must be committed to doing it. Why? Because he said, if you love me, you would obey my commandments. And if you will love him, you'll be disciplined in his word. We have our spiritual meals, just like the athlete. Our spiritual meals must keep us fit, because it requires to get rid of all the bad things that are there for us. That's why we are being held down. We will create the right habits like church, attendance, Bible study, praying, that's both on an individual, you and God, and corporate prayer, paying your tithes, serving others, spreading the gospel. All these things come with a strong foundation in Christ. And we will get rid of the bad habits, but how are we going to get rid of the bad habits? These bad habits that are keeping us so heavy, these bad habits that are keeping us back from having a true and joyful life in Christ. So, let's look at how we clean the house. The people in our lives. The people in our, uh, hmm. the people in our lives. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 said, Do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. My brothers and sisters, choose your friends wisely. If you are in company of someone who does not share the same values and beliefs as you, you will, your walk with Christ will be difficult. Now, there are two categories 
with the company we keep. One will require light dusting. You know there are some areas in a house, just need light dusting. We don't have to do it, just pass a broom every now and again. Not high traffic area. It's not major. So there are some people we do not have to remove entirely. Sign of relief. We can meet with them every now and again. Why? Because it will give them the opportunity to see the change in us. We can do some friendship evangelism. Yeah? So we could draw them in slowly because some people require that. The young Christians, or we call them the baby Christians, they will be saying, well, by keeping them around, you know, we can teach them about Christ and saying, yes, but you're fooling yourselves. It is better for you to develop and have a strong foundation in Christ first before you can change that group of friends. Amen? Amen. Feeling some heavy weight here. <laughs> or you may be successful in getting a few friends to church, but you're not spending enough time with mature Christians. So what you're doing is you're coming together as a group and one cannot help the other because you're not growing. There's no one there to teach you the word other than what you're hearing here. No one to encourage you to get into that word every, every chance you get. No one to show you how to pull yourselves out of the world. Although the Holy Spirit is there convicting you, but still we need encouragement from each other. So what you become is you become church attendees. And then what happens, just like a place in a house that we don't clean, after a while it started to develop some mold and fungus and some rust, yes? Same thing happens. Then you'll find that group just tearing apart. There's no foundation. We need to build relationships with mature Christians that will guide and help you in your spiritual growth. We have some friendships, however, that require some heavy-duty cleaning. Oh, boy. And this one requires pain. You ever had an old jersey with a set of stain and some holes and you don't want to get rid of it? It's the most comfortable jersey, a home jersey. Yeah? <laughs> Or some of us, you know, you raise up your arm and there's this AC under there. <laughs> Don't want to get part with that at all. Some of us will have a pillow for years. Smelling like 10 raw food, you know, but you, you hugging up this thing like if it's a dozen roses. <laughs> Refuse to get rid of it. Because, you know what? Those things bring comfort and good memories to us, yes? Yeah. Just like some people in our lives. But unfortunately, they hinder our spiritual growth. And if we were to get rid of some of those, those people that is, we will make leaps and bounds in our spiritual growth. There are some people in our lives that are not good for us, and it's hard, my brothers and sisters, but we need to get rid of them permanently. Unfortunately, it's hard, yes, but they're not doing us any good. There are some people that steal our joy. I don't know if you ever had one of those. Yes, this is a popular, popular one. They suck all the energy out of you. And when you leave the comp your company, you drain. Yes. Yeah? You know the young people that say you're a sucker? <laughs> That is suckers. <laughs> when you leave their company, sometimes they, you feel bad about yourself. You ever have some of those? Yeah. My brothers and sisters, you know they have a vacuum that is called by the enemy's name. We're not going to use that one. It starts with D. We're not going to use that. But what we'll use, pull out your Jesus vacuum. Press power and get rid of those people, please. All right, we need to get rid of them. Clear them out your life. The thing about it is, you know, our comfort with these people 
and, and, the, and, and the, the memories, our brain is telling us, yes, this, this person is right for us, but it's really not happening. It's really not happening. This is how the enemy works on us. There are people that come in under our lives for a season. And we need to embrace that they're, they're just for a season. They've been put into our life for, 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 for them to do a work in us because God is doing a work in us. So they're teaching us some lessons. And then there are some that we will be teaching lessons as well. So they're there for just a time, but we need to embrace that they're just for a time and let them go when they're ready to go. Don't hold on. Don't hold on to the dirt. Let it go. Let the dust go. Some people come into our lives at the wrong time. And they will hinder our progress. And they will set us on a different path. Sometimes they end up being your foundation and not Jesus Christ. So we need to identify if this person is here at the right time. So how do we identify that? Well, God is a God of peace. If you are not experiencing peace and there's all wrong resistance, tension, confusion, guess what? It's not necessarily the right time for this person in your life. Amen? Amen. Second Corinthians 6, 14 says, Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what, what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Oh, well, this is a, a popular one. Our single believers who seek relationships with non-believers. We convince ourselves that we are going to do some evangelism and bring them to Christ. This is like walking through mud and walking in your house with your shoes on. You can make a mess of things. They will not have the same value system as you, my brothers and sisters. Do not allow your emotions and passion to get rid, to get the better of you. You're binding yourself with someone who will not be your spiritual partner. Not good to hear. This only leads to compromise. Amen? And it's similarly when we go out there and we are, we are seeking friendships on a whole. We find ourselves in clubs. We find ourselves in places and people, with people that, again, that are not believers. They, they don't share the same value system as you. So it's going to be very hard. You'll find yourself suppressing to talk about God. This ever happens? You're in a crowd of people and you're sitting out? No? No? Yeah, you don't, you don't want to talk about Jesus Christ. They're watching you and you're feeling uncomfortable because you can't be yourself. As opposed to, have you ever been in a nice Christian line? Fellowshipping with Christians? Yeah? And we could, you know, you could talk freely about God and, you know, and, and it could give encouragement. It's so different. It's so different. You can learn so much more then why are we choosing to go with the worldly friends? We make a conscious choice. We make a conscious choice to bring dirt back into the house. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong places and activities. There are some places that are prone to dirt. So you might be on the seaside, constant sea blasts will be eroding all the stuff in the house. Or you might be living in an area where there's a lot of dust and, you know, every time you sweep, more coming in, sweep, more coming in. We find ourselves in, the, in, in those high traffic areas, yes? And a Christian that frequents a bar, liming on the avenue, <laughs> carnival fest. Social clubs, casinos, 
and any other worldly activity will find their souls corrupted. High traffic areas, lots of corruption, lots of erosion. If we are placing ourselves in these places and situations, we are being constantly tempted. The enemy is attacking us every single day. Why are we going to put ourselves in places where it's going to make it, easy, make it easier for him? And make it so difficult for us to say no. We are setting up ourselves. Our minds will be constantly filled with corruption. Our Facebook time and our TV time all adds to it which should be cut down and more time spent in the word of God. When we open doors for the enemy, my brothers and sisters, he starts to corrupt our minds and it's difficult for us to grow spiritually. Do we know what those doors are? How we open doors to the enemy? Are we aware? I'm seeing a lot of blank faces. Well, let's look at a few of them. Some of you will know them already. Sight. The porn sites that we are looking at and opening up the doors for the enemy to come and corrupt your imagination. He will keep those visions in front of you in your mind. You will start seeing men and women in a different way. You will even come to church and you will look at somebody and guess what is flashing before your eyes. In church, when you pray, your sexual appetite will increase and giving power to that spirit of lust when we open that gate. The enemy comes in just by the things that we are looking at. Your sexual appetite again increases, and of course, you start to sin. You start to self-indulge. That dirty feeling that you have will keep you away from your spiritual growth in Christ. A relationship with God, you will not seek a relationship with God. It will be very difficult. And you will feel unworthy of having a relationship with God. Smell. The marijuana. <laughs> or any drug, as a matter of fact, that we use to inhale. Starts to affect our pattern of thinking. Gives us a false, false sense of release. And it makes us indulge in the things that we are not supposed to do. <laughs> Young people, again, who are fooling themselves. And this is how the enemy, eh? the enemy convinced you that this is a healthy drug. It's being approved all over the world. Yeah. <laughs> it's legal, so we can do it, and everybody's doing it. Yeah. But what are the effects of it? It gives you that false sense of joy. It's, a, it's, it's false. And on top of that, you indulge in doing the wrong things. Ephesians 5.18 says, And do not be drunk with wine in which dissipation, dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So we read this and we say, okay, and do not be drunk with wine, so everything else is good. Yeah. The, but the scripture said don't be drunk with wine. Didn't say anything about marijuana here, you know. Dissipate means showing signs of overindulging in alcohol and other pleasures. And other pleasures. So we're supposed to be really filled with the Spirit, which is not temporary. It can give us a lasting joy. So even if it is that we have that ball and chain, 
wrap around our foot, we could still jump with one foot and, and praise God because we, we know what he can give us. We know what having a foundation in Christ is all about. But when we indulge in those things, we always want more. We're looking for something else to give, give us that relief. And we start looking in the wrong places. Christians listening to gospel music will find themselves singing at times with God's word. And it works on our subconscious. That happens to you. You hear the, the music in the air. This morning I got up and I heard it in my ear. I said, ooh, nice. It works. Puts you in a mood. You find yourself singing it, so again, it's working on your subconscious. Same thing happens when we are listening to the wrong things. The same things. This is another gate. Hearing. Listening, this, listening to the wrong things. It works on our minds. Then we start believing the things that they're saying. The enemy is out. It's a battlefield up here, ladies and gentlemen. It's a battlefield, brothers and sisters. And if it is that we constantly feed the enemy, he's going to win. He's going to win over you. Taste the alcohol, the wrong spirit. <laughs> Again, the enemy enters the soul with this drug. It affects our ability to reason. You lose control. You find yourself in compromising situations. So we need to be careful. But this is one. Touch. I know the single Christians will not agree with me here. Oh, I'm married too. We need to be careful. You know, a lot of us love to hug. Yes. When we hug someone in an intimate way, the enemy starts to work on our affections. And that lustful spirit starts to activate. Before you know it, you're indulging in premarital sex. And you say, oh, come on, oh, Brother Richard, oh, that could happen just with a little hug. And then when you get there, you want to know, how come you end up there? Slowly but surely. We start one in one area, and then we move up, and we move up, and we move up, until we are overboard. That's what happens, and that's how the enemy works. So as we continue to feed the enemy through these gates, our senses, the enemy has control of our mind. We are responsible, my brothers and sisters. We are responsible for keeping ourselves in darkness. This heavy weight that we are carrying around, this burden of sin that we are dragging around that steals our joy, we are, we are opening the gates. We are feeding ourselves. We are allowing the enemy to come straight ahead of us. Colossians 3, you could turn to Colossians 3, and then, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is in your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. We can change our moral and ethical behavior, my brothers and sisters, by allowing Christ to live within us, to change us. Christ, Christ likes to clean out house, you know. He's cleaning out your house, you know. If you will only allow him in, allow him to clean us out. We can't do it by ourselves, you know. But we can help. Simply by identifying these areas that the enemy come, comes to us. He said, for you died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Meaning you should have a little, little, you should have little desire for worldly pleasure. Hidden in Christ is your place of safety. 
It's your seal. And that's why it's important for us to have that strong foundation in Christ. Amen? Verse 4 says, if we live each day when Christ who is our life appears, our life, Christ being our life, if we live each day for Christ, we can be sure of our salvation. Verse 5, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. So verse 5 refers to sexual sin and perversion. This again drains your energy. You feel dirty and, and, and you can't move further from God, further with God. You start to, to move away from him. Verse 8 says, But now you yourselves are put... Of all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. We have a Christian cursing. What? <laughs> oh, oh, we want to say cussing? <laughs> huh? Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on a new man who is renewed in him, knowledge according to the image of him who created him. So verse 8 told us to get rid of evil practices and immorality. And then lying, which is another dirty habit some of us have. Lying breaks down trust, my brothers and sisters. How can you respect someone that lies a lot? How can we? What part of the relationship will be real if you are having a relationship with someone who is a liar. What part of the relationship will be real? Can you identify that if it is that they lie all the time? And have put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. That's what we're saying. A Christian's conduct must be lined up with God. The nature of your character should mirror Christ. The new man in Christ involves the right choices daily. Let me challenge you. If you were to do a log, just one week. I don't know if I could give you a whole week. But if you can do a log where you can identify when you make a conscious choice to choose God or the world. God or the world, what that log would look like. Silence. <laughs> Try it. Let's challenge ourselves. Do it out day or two and see how many times we actually consciously choose the world over Christ. To get rid of this dirt in our lives, this heaviness of sin, we need to repent. Humility cures worldliness. James 4, 7, 10 tells us, and you should see it on the board, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. So James is first of all telling us we need to humble ourselves. To humble ourselves to God means we have to give him full authority. His will be done in your life. First of all, and that is something we do not like because he has full control. We like to control our life. So this is very hard. And we must be willing to follow him, willing to follow God's word. Resist the devil. We need to recognize Satan's ways, and we just discussed a few of them, 
of tempting us, and we must resist. We must resist. Wash your hands of sin. Get rid of it. We are no longer slaves, slaves to our sinful nature. Yes? We have a choice. Replace that desire to, to sin with the desire to live a pure life in Christ. It's a choice every day, every minute of our day to choose to replace that sinful desire. You must be really sorry for the things you have done. If you're not sorry, then you, how could you be repentant for something? If you're really not sorry, oh, Father, forgive me. Yes, I sinned, you know, I did this. Uh, yeah. That worked. You must have a sorrowful heart. One of deep regret. Humbling ourselves before the Lord means recognizing that we are nothing without him. Nothing. We are nothing. Bring our sins before God is an important part of our cleaning our house. Bringing it up. Bringing it before. As a matter of fact, you know, we are some clean freaks. You know, those who always clean any house, everything must be in place. Yeah? We have any? You don't want to tell me? Huh? huh? Yes? That's good. That's good. You know, we must be like that with God's house. We must be like that with his temple, God's house. Proverbs 28, 13 says, As He who covers his sins will not, will not prosper, but who ever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. To forsake is to renounce, meaning to say no to something or someone. And that is the first step in repentance, meaning to turn away. To turn away. When we identify these things we did in our lives, my brothers and sisters, that was not lined up with God, we need to bring it before God and ask him for our forgiveness. But not only ask him for forgiveness, we need to turn away completely from it. We are not to go back in it. We are not to indulge in it. We need to ask God to help us to identify some of these things. Some of it is so embedded there that... We took it for granted that it really wasn't even that bad sometimes. We need to ask God to bring that. Bring it to our, the forefront so we can get rid of it. Whatever it is that is holding us back. We must be constantly cleaning out. As it comes, we need to get rid of it. We need to develop that habit. Constantly cleaning out God's house. As we clean out God's house, we need to keep some things in mind. There is no sin that is too great for God to forgive. And that is not our excuse to do it. Although God forgives us, he does not erase the consequences of sin. He does not erase it. Sin that is not confessed hinders your intimacy with God. So if you're, leave, if you're just holding on to it, if you have not confessed it, if you have not brought it before God, it's going to stop you. That dirt is still there. When God forgives our sins, he restores our fellowship with him. When God, as we're supposed to say amen for that. When God forgives our sins, he restores our fellowship with him. Well, of course, when we accepted Jesus Christ, he, he cleanses us from our sin, but that doesn't relieve us of, of ever sinning again. That's why we need to be constantly clearing it out. But there are some things that he forgot. He said as far as the east is from the west. But some things we held on to. And it's still holding us back. So which means that that date is there that's embedded in our minds. Eh? Not according to him, but for you. You can't move forward because you held on to it. You kept it inside. 
He cleaned it out. You held on to it. And then you also started to add to it. When we experience a restored fellowship with Christ, we will experience a joy that we can we can't help but encourage others. It's a joy that we, we just can't explain. You have to tell people all about Jesus Christ and how he forgives. When we actually experience that joy, restoration is reflected in a joyful heart and a spirit. So if we're not praising God and if we're not walking in here with that joy in our hearts, well then something is wrong, something is terribly wrong. I know this was a difficult one. But we need to hear it. And the fact is, we need to clean our house. So in closing, we're going to look at Psalm 51. Where David was truly, truly sorry for his adultery with Bathsheba. For murdering her husband to cover it up. And because of David, a man was murdered. A baby died. Because we are born sinners, we naturally like to please ourselves, my brothers and sisters. But David asked God to clean him from within. He pleaded with God to clean him from within. We tend to do the right things when we have a clean heart and spirit. Amen? Amen. So let us stand while we read Psalm 51, and we are taking it from verse 1 to 13. And hopefully after this, we can start jumping for joy. <laughs> Have mercy upon me, O God. According to the multitude Cover 13. This is a fantastic psalm to help with our repentance as well. Eh? You know, but I just want to read from verse 10 again. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. 
Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your way and sinners shall be converted to you. Big difference. It's not just to read it. The thing about it is we have to really... I mean, David was really pleading here. He was really pleading here to be cleaned out. And that is what we need to get to. We need to have a repentant heart. We need to be always coming to Christ. Clean me out. Clean this house. That is what we need to get to. We need to be clean freaks when it comes to God's house. Amen? Amen. Sometimes at home too. But, but we need to clean God's house, my brothers and sisters. And we will find that joy. We will we'll be jumping for joy when it's time for, for worship. You know, the thing about it is we will have, we will, we will have that, that lightness. We'll, have, we'll feel so good about ourselves if it is that we, we identify these areas and these things that we need to cut out. Cleaning out is cutting out, getting rid of. And we need to do that. Amen? Amen. Let's just bow our heads. Father, we thank you for your word here today. We thank you for your spirit that is convicting us of those things that we need to get rid of in our lives as we hear your word here this morning. Oh, Father, we thank you for uplifting us, and we thank you for the forgiveness of our sins and helping us to move forward with a life in Christ, Father. We thank you for bringing up all those things to the forefront of our minds that we need to bring before you and to get rid of by confessing and asking for forgiveness. So, Father, we thank you for opening up our hearts to this word. We know for some of us it was difficult to hear, but, Father, we are in, the, in your house. We believe in your word. We believe in your conviction of your spirit. And, Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy and your love, which is always sufficient. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
God bless you richly. You may be seated. I once knew someone who loved to use Psalm 51. And this is real, this is not hearsay. They would say Psalm 51, and close the Bible, and then go right back and do the same thing that they had been doing. This makes sense. Psalm 51 is about someone who was penitent, who was truly sorry for what they had done, who had remorse for what they had done. And Psalm 51 is a confession, and it is also a repentance. We must understand the difference between confession and repentance. Confession is acknowledging the sin, asking God's forgiveness. Repentance is turning away from the sin. So there is no repentance if you confess and you go back to doing the same thing. Maybe you would like to repent. Maybe down the road you may repent, but there is no repentance unless you have turned away. We must always remember that. So when David acknowledged his sin before God, asking God to create in him a clean heart, renew a right spirit with him, he turned away. Nowhere in the word of God would we find that David did what he did with Bathsheba. Total repentance. So I'm sure this morning that we have heard some truth from the word of God. And whilst each and every one of us, every single one of us, it may not be applicable to Always remember that God has a message for every single person at some point in time. And he says, if one sheep goes astray, he would leave the 90 and 9 and go after that one so that he can restore that one. 